Hi and welcome to Leitrim Daily. My name is Brefni Early and you are listening to the Leitrim Daily podcast. Today's show is a current affair but to be honest my guest would fit in just as neatly into Kiss My Arts or in focus in terms of his business acumen around the county. My guest today is none other than former county councillor, musician and a million other topics that we're going to get into in not too distant future. John McCartan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much Brefni, it's great to be here. Well, thank you very much for dropping in because I know you've had a particularly busy, interesting, scary, intimidating couple of weeks and months over the last little while. We're going to talk a bit more about that later on. But first of all, the reason you're in Carrick and Challenge today is to play a gig tonight. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, right after we're finished here, I'm going to go down to the uh, to the train station and pick up uh, Donal Lunny, uh, who's been a hero of mine since I was a small child. Uh, so pick up Donal, we go, we'll do a little bit of rehearsal and we're going to do a gig with Dylan Carlos and Key and Sweeney. Um, we've just done a, a, an album called Carlos Sweeney McCartan, uh, which we released to very little fanfare. Uh, Three of us work, so we never consider ourselves to be professional musicians, and uh, we're also selfish men, so we recorded an album of music that pleased us and nobody else, and uh, we didn't really ask what anybody wanted to hear, we just played what we wanted to play, and released it, and for some strange reason it's really taken off. We've done no major PR on it, we've done no advertising on it, we haven't really done the radio station circuit with it or anything like that, did a few launches and discovered that young people want to buy it. Uh, so um, whenever we go to festivals, music festivals around the country and do our little gigs, what we notice is that the older musicians and the people older my age, for, I'm 44 now, so people from that age bracket up uh, don't pass much remarks on us, but the younger ones all know us. So it's a, it's a, it's an odd thing that um, that we, we seem to have struck a chord there by, by complete accident. Okay, of course, it'll be too late for people listening to this on Saturday to have gone. The gig would have been last night as people are listening to this, but at the same time, you do play regularly around so people can keep an eye out. In terms of your music, tell us maybe where we can find more information on you. Um, well, I guess I, I'm i a little bit nomadic and a bit mercenary. I, I play with a lot of people from time to time. Um, I, one particular group that I play a lot with is a group called Garadice, which is named after the lake in, in County Leitrim near where I live. Uh, I play with Eleanor Shanley, Dave Sheridan and Pori McGovern in that, in that particular configuration and uh, we're in Leeds next weekend. Uh, I don't have a list of gigs ahead of me but anybody who Googles us will find out where we are. Um, we Is the Leitrim a, Equation another? Well the Leitrim Equation was almost the start of the Garadice thing so for two or three years, maybe, uh, yeah I think it was around three years, um, Leitrim County Council actually asked Eleanor, Dave Sheridan, Parik McGovern and myself uh, to be involved with a project called the Leitrim Equation. And that initially started off as a project whereby Leitrim invited, Leitrim County Council invited musicians, well-known established acts from outside the county to come and spend some time in the county and examine what the county has offered the tradition, what the county has offered to their music and to see what they can take away from meeting the musicians in the county. So that started initially with a band called Lunasa. Then it, uh, the next iteration of that was with a band called Dervish and then the next iteration was with John Carty, Donald Lunny and Seamus Begley. And then we decided instead of this being a sort of an introspective thing that uh, we would do a sort of an evangelistic sort of project. Instead of saying to people, come here and see what we have, we said, let's bring it out there. Let's just maximum attack. Let's let's launch on the rest of the world of music. So so we did. We, we got together. We had great fun. Uh, we're three people that... Uh, just get on, or four people that get on very well together and, and have lots of fun when we're at it and we did a lot of gigs. People seemed to enjoy the dynamic we had on stage. We were we were bold and we were uh, uh, boisterous and self-effacing and people seemed to get a good kick out of it. So we, when that project was over we formed the band Garadice and uh, we released an album which got uh, was very well received and we gigged a bit and still gig a bit. And, uh, so uh, it was sort of on the back of that, I would say, that having got the taste for doing recorded projects that I, I said yes to doing the Carlos Sweeney McCartan thing, because up to that I was always kind of a little bit afraid of recording projects. It seemed like too much like work to me. You could just go to the pub and play a few sessions and... Yeah, and I was, I was happy to do that, yeah, yeah, or even just do a gig, um, but the whole notion of sitting down and organising an album and, uh, and, and 
unfortunately, when you do something like that, it's on the record. You know, it's it's literally a record. And the mistakes that you make there are there to haunt you for the rest of your life. And you're there to, com- to be compared to everybody else for the rest of your life. So um, I've always been shy about doing that. I've always been insecure about being compared, you know, to the, to the, to the greats of the tradition. So um, I, I guess when you, when you do pop that little bubble, though, it's easier to keep moving. When you, get, when you get rid of your inhibitions and you just say, look, at it, I'm, not, I'm never going to be the best in the world. Nobody's, only one person can be the best. So the rest of us have to settle for just doing our thing and enjoying it and doing it as good as we can. And once you get past that, then you don't mind doing your recordings. You don't mind putting your work on the record and you don't mind it being compared to everybody else. In terms of the music, obviously, you might tell us, most people who are listening to this who know you will be familiar with you. They've seen you play before. What instruments do you play? I know the guitar is in there, but are there others? Yeah, well, I started off as a fiddle player, uh, and that would have been how I came into the tradition. My, my grandfather's uncle, uh, and a lot of his family indeed were great musicians, but in particular, my grandfather's uncle went away to America and uh, spent a lot of time playing music and spent a lot of time drinking pints. And uh, for that reason, my grandfather wouldn't allow anybody in his family to have an instrument. So there was a, a complete sterilization, you can say, of, of the practice of music uh, from the McCartan household. But the love of the music was always there. And my grandmother, who had been in Philadelphia uh, at the, in the early parts of the last century, had brought home a gramophone from Philadelphia, which I still have, uh, and, and a number of records. And every Christmas they would go to Cryons in Baltimore and buy another couple of records. And then records would come in the post from America. So they were very conscious of traditional music. And my father was, was mesmerized by it. So when we were children, he always vowed that we would have the chance. Uh, and people who often talk about, you know, aren't you lucky to be talented? I think most people are talented. Most people are, could do it if they got the chance. I was lucky. I got the chance. So instruments were bought and were readily available to us when we were children. And the fiddle came my way, and I started playing the fiddle. Uh, started learning with a guy called Frank Kelly in uh, in Balnamore in the community centre, and I enjoyed it. And the music he pointed me towards interested me. And as well as that, my father's love of music meant that when I was a little child and he was in politics, the only chance I had to be with him was to travel in the car with him, be it to, to his clinics or if there was an election on while he'd be campaigning. And uh, he had the original uh, Planksty album. It was always known as the Black Album, that original Planksty album, but it was a red cassette. I remember it very well. And I listened to that intensely over and over again. And uh, so while I had the melody music from those who were teaching me, the like of Frank Kelly and the, the, and the gramophone records and the, the likes of Frankie Gavin that my teacher had been pointing me towards uh, and De Danon, the accompaniment and especially the, accom- the complicated nature of the accompaniment of the music that Planksty was doing, it was extremely sophisticated. Uh, it was... It was an absolute maze of counter melodies and counter rhythms and layers of decoration on the music that I was spellbound by. Uh, So while learning all the tunes on the fiddle, my ear or one of my ears was always cocked towards this peripheral stuff that was going on around the music. So um, by the time I was into my teenage years and feeling a bit rebellious, I began to say, I'm going to play the guitar. And I was in school in Ballinasloe in Garbally, and there were a couple of guitars in, the, in a music room down there. And I picked out a few chords for myself and was hammering away at them. Uh, I'm sure it was a misery for anybody who had to be beside me while I was at it. And uh, just give myself the sort of basics of how to play the guitar. Then after school, when, when, I, when I came back out of Garbley, I met a few musicians around here locally, and I went back to the fiddle. And I played the fiddle f- until I was about 27 years of age. I remember there was a bazooki player who always played with us, and that provided the accompaniment. That, that scratched my itch for the decoration and the accompaniment of the music. And when he, um, he, he, just, he went off to do other things and left us with no accompanist, and some of the lads said, Jeez, I think McCartan, you play the guitar, do you? And I said... I could try. So um, I, I got myself a proper guitar and started to, to as we, we do often say, to back sessions, you know, but to accompany the music in sessions. And from that on, really, when people asked me to do gigs, it was always the guitar I was asked to do. 
So since then, what does that say about your fiddle playing? But obviously, it was horrible <laughs> <laughs> because my guitar playing wasn't great at the time. So the fiddle playing must have been scandalous altogether when I when I was asked to play the guitar. But you know, since then, I've been really lucky in my music. I've always enjoyed it. I've met great people through music. I've met a lot of very good friends, and especially around County Leitrim here, um, you know, we're surrounded by a wealth of talented musicians, but they're good people as well. You know, I've been very lucky to meet the likes of, you know, Tom Morrow from down the road, Tom and Andy, the whole Morrow family, salt of the art people, but fantastic musicians, legends around the world of traditional music. Liam Kelly, Dave Sheridan, Pori McGovern, here in town, you know, you do have the likes of Mick Mulvey, he's out the road there. Uh, there's just so many good people involved in music here that I've been very lucky. They're not the lunatics you usually associate with music. They're a bit mad, all right, but they're, uh, but they're, they're solid people. So I've had a great experience with music, and then I've gotten to play with all my heroes. Uh, so as I say, picking up, having listened to Planksty when I was a kid, to be, you know, to, to be picking up Don Lunny from the train in an hour here in 45 minutes, I'm picking up Don Lunny. I have to pinch myself. I'm picking up Don Lunny at the train. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's, it's been an absolutely brilliant journey for me. Yeah, I can see you just light up when you talk about music. It's obviously yeah. a huge passion for you. Yeah. Another interest that you've had over the years is politics. Obviously, you stepped down from the council this year after, I'm going to say, 10 years on the yeah. council. Yeah, it was 10 years. Um, but obviously, you mentioned your father was involved in politics. Your mother was the backbone of the family. She yeah. was the real politician in the house, yeah. if, if it was to be believed. She passed away earlier this year. Um, mm. How much of an impact did that have on your life? Um, well, obviously, politics has had a huge impact on my life. It's been a, you know, it, the configuration of a family has to sit around politics. It doesn't, uh, politics doesn't yield. Families have to yield to politics. And you either support politics and, and, and allow it to, to shape the, the life of your family or, or it doesn't work for you. So my father was involved in, I suppose he was in the Senate, he was in the Dáil, he was on the council here, he was in the European Parliament. And really, that meant he was never at home. So that left the unit at home really was my mother uh, and my brother and I. So uh, it was she had to keep the the show on the road. Uh, and then come election time, it was all hands on deck. So she, my mother was a, you know, she was a quiet woman, but she was a fantastic worker. She was very energetic. She was very, um, she was very driven when she took something on. Uh, she was, uh, you know, and very well received. So she was a great asset to my father when, when election time would come. She, you know, I remember hearing people giving out and saying that she had burned out half the men in North Leitrim canvas and that nobody could keep up with her. <laughs> she could go for days and days, eat very little, sleep very little, and just just plow through the work. So, you know, she was a, she was a, a tremendous spine of support in the family. And, uh, but, you know, she lived a lonely life because of politics. And, um, while you know, I was reared with politics and always had an interest in politics, the interest I had was never in elections and it was never in the dog fight. It was never in you know, what some people get a great kick out of, counts and campaigns and, and who's coming and who's going and who, who did well and who didn't do well. I, I never liked that. I was never interested in any of that. But I've always been interested in the way that civic society is organised. I've always been interested in how you can marry people's responsibilities with people's entitlements and make sure that everything works for everybody. I've always been interested in that. And so that's what interested me in politics. Never the campaigns, never the elections, never the, the razzmatazz and never the excitement. I was never interested in any of that. Uh, and I, I probably, probably got turned off from all of that because of how I saw that can be a destructive force in a family, that can be a, a, a wearing force on a family, and it can make a family a very lonely place for somebody who's trying to, to support uh, the, the fabric of a family while another family member is away on those campaigns. In terms of speaking about the family, obviously, let's talk a little bit about Newtown Gore, about your own family unit mm -hmm. and your day-to-day -day life. I suppose your main role is actually running your own business, Newtown Gore Engineering. Yeah. Tell us a bit about all of that and how that works. So I have five kids and they're all certifiably mad. Um, I don't know where they got that from. Uh, they must have got, I have from, no they, idea they must have got it from her side. But uh, no, I'm... You know, like in, in most things in my life, I'm, I've been very lucky with my family as well. I married Edel Connerfree from three miles up the road. Um, we are settled in Newtown Gore. We, my oldest daughter, we have three girls and two boys. My oldest daughter is 15. Uh, then we have two more girls between her and twin boys who are eight. So 
the house is lively to say the least and um, it's it's great fun I could never have imagined enjoying parenthood this way I always thought parenthood was a job but it's it's an absolute adventure when you have such a crowd of lunatics living in the house which it's it's really great fun uh, then I'm also lucky to have my business next door to me which is you know I lit I can roll out of bed um, wash two or three children and then st I'm straight into work and uh, so I'm sure I'll, your 15 year old daughter won't appreciate you saying just so yeah. long <laughs> well no I, I, but she she's able to get herself out in the mornings now at this stage it's the younger ones you're talking yeah. about yeah so we um yeah so i work uh most of my time in uh, near home uh, not too far away anymore. Uh, I'm on the Board of Governors of NUI Galway, so that's uh, my excuse every now and again to get away for uh, for 24 hours. <laughs> and uh, So I, I, I attend those meetings maybe every two or three weeks. Um, but for the most part, I'm either around home or somewhere in the vicinity. And uh, I, I enjoy that. Leitrim, rural Ireland, but particularly Leitrim, which is so rural, there's a quality of life that people don't realize we have. Uh, we can move freely. We have our privacy, but yet we're not too far away from anything. Like when you consider, I could be in Dublin airport in an hour and 40 minutes. I can be in Knock airport in an hour. I can be in Sligo in an hour. I can be in Longford in half an hour, Cavan in half an hour, Carrick and Shannon in half an hour, Inniskillen in half an hour. It's um, like if, if I lived somewhere uh, in Dublin at times of the day, I wouldn't get to the end of the street in half an hour. So, uh, then, and then you have this little social fabric that's around you. You're connected, you know everybody. If somebody asks you, where do I get a plumber? You can think of three off the top of your head and you have their mobile numbers and you can ring them and talk to them directly. There is a fantastic privilege to live in and work in, in a place like Leitrim that people don't understand until they're here. Uh, so yeah, I, I, enjoy my, I enjoy my career here in Leitrim. Absolutely, uh, and I, I echo that as well because I suppose I, I spent 20 years away and came back and it's only since I started doing this maybe five months ago where you actually appreciate how much actually goes on here that we probably don't really appreciate or, or know mm. about on a daily basis. I suppose in, in terms of music and politics, you'd be aware of a lot of that stuff yourself. Um, let's talk about the last couple of months, uh, even the last couple of years, because you mentioned you're on the board of directors of NUI Galway. You're also chairman of the board of directors at Quinn Industrial Holdings. How did that come about originally? I suppose it's well documented in the media, the, um, the collapse of the Quinn Group as it was and what, what basically happened. They were profitable companies. Uh, they were all good going concerns, but uh, a punt on Anglo-Irish shares um, caused the appointment of a share receiver to the Quinn family shares in, that, in those companies. Uh, that put them immediately into the control of Anglo-Irish Bank or, or IBRC as it is now. Uh, but there was senior debt on the manufacturing assets. So there were guys who, had, who were senior in the debt structure, 43 American financial institutions, and they swooped on the manufacturing assets. The stuff, you know, the, the companies we all know, Quinn Cement, Quinn, um, uh, Quinn Light Blocks, um, the Light Pack in Granard there, um, the Quinn Tarmac, the Quarries, um, Quinn Therm, Packaging, all those companies, 43 American financial institutions swooped on those, took them, took control of them. Of course, Liberty Insurance would have been part of this group at the time. What is Liber now Liberty yes. Insurance? Yes, what the, Liberty was part of uh, Quinn Insurance, as it was called, or Quinn Direct, as it was called then. That was part of it in those days. But but that had its own problems in the fact, it, because of the punt on Anglo, some of the, some of the assets of that insurance company that it needed to maintain a solvency rate that would equalize its exposure and risk to the insurance market. Some of those assets were also used as guarantees to raise debt to prop up the investment in Anglo-Irish Bank. And that caused uh, the financial regulator to step in and take control of Quinn Insurance, uh, which was later, Quinn Direct, it was later then disposed of uh, to, uh, to Liberty. So, so that, that disappeared out of the equation as well. Um, we uh, would have always had, and I had a particular worry that the guys who were running the Quinn manufacturing assets that were all based beside us and employing people beside us, the guys who were running that, their job wasn't to make cement. Their job, you know, th their responsibility wasn't to the region. It wasn't to the companies. Their responsibility was to the 
um, to the investors, the, the debt holders. And their job was, as I say, not to make cement, not to employ people, not to develop the region, but their job was to get money for investors. And our fear was that without a credible management team and without a credible uh, plan to move the businesses forward, what they would do is dispose of them. So anything that could be unbolted from the ground, there would be no reason to have a packaging factory in Ballyconnell other than you wanted to live in Ballyconnell and employ people in Ballyconnell. So un- the simple thing to do with that is just unbolt it and unbolt it from the ground and ship it out. Uh, that would have happened with a number of the business units. Then there were other business units there that it probably would have made sense for a competitor to buy it and close it. Uh, wind it down, strip out whatever is useful out of it, but close it and just take capacity out of the market. And this uh, is all essentially just job cuts for the local area? Yeah, and like when you look at the impact of all of that, it would have been thousands of jobs in a very rural area. It would have been absolute devastation. Um, I had had a couple of brief discussions with Sean Quinn about all of this, but nothing uh, nothing more than offering him friendly advice. Then I just by chance at a meeting in the Bush Hotel happened to meet some of the executives for, that were appointed by the, the share receivers. And um, I chatted to them and they were pretty much a besieged management team at the time. And I, I spoke respectfully to them and they appreciated that. So they, um, they said that we should keep a bit of contact and I did keep a bit of contact and that eventually led to forming of a company called QBRC with a view to buying back those assets and installing a local management team and also giving Sean Quinn a chance to come back and work in the businesses until he had rehabilitated his, his image, gotten himself out of bankruptcy, settled his litigation with the state and eventually that he would be in a position to acquire them and take them forward. So uh, I suppose to cut a long story short, because there's no point in getting into the details of it that would bore your listeners to tears, we eventually got a deal done whereby uh, with three of the existing 43 American investors, we did uh, form a company that bought them. We did install the local management team that had run them before and Sean joined the company again and moved back into his old office as a consultant. And um, But sometime after, um, there were differences of opinion. Um, some people viewed the project that the most important thing was the preservation of the jobs and the uh, and the preservation of the businesses. And I think other people thought that the best thing to do was to um, position them so that they could be easily picked off in another uh, buyout. And I subscribed to the view that that strategy was damaging and risky uh, to both the employment and to their businesses, and I didn't subscribe to it. And sometime after that, we found ourselves the um, the subject of a campaign of defamation and then a campaign of uh, intimidation and then threats, death threats. And uh, mm. unfortunately, what happened lately, the uh, kidnapping and uh, torture of Kevin Lunny uh, and... Uh, a stark warning to us all that uh, the next time it would be one of us would be shot. So that's that's where we got to over the last four and a half years with all of that. Now, uh, recently, the other day in the Irish News newspaper, they've published a list of, of that intimidation and that campaign of um, information or misinformation or assaults. And it, it goes on for ages. It mm-hmm. starts back in February 2015, I think, or January 2015, with a, a, an articulated lorry being burnt out at Derry Lynn and just continues and continues. And each one in itself would be the subject of a Hollywood movie. Mm. And here it's there's, there's 30 or 40 or 50 incidents over the last four or five years that just culminated, I suppose, in terms of the public perception, at least in, outside of the Ballyconnell Derry Lynn area, in the abduction and, and torture, as you mentioned, of, of Kevin Lunny. Mm. How is Kevin? Kevin's doing remarkably well, considering what he's been through. I mean, he the physical assault that he endured was pretty horrific, um, right down to, you know, obviously the, the rough nature of his abduction, but then thrown into the boot of a car, driven for half an hour, um, then pulled out of there, put into a horse box, uh, having his leg broken twice, um, being sliced with a Stanley knife, um, having... You know, having stuff carved out on him as messages uh, with a Stanley knife, having his nails removed with a Stanley knife to to cleanse any DNA material that might have been left on him, being bleached all over and then dumped at the side of the road with a with a warning to the rest of us uh, to deliver to us. 
Um, that's, uh, you know, the nature, the physical nature of all of that left Kevin with, a, with quite a long road to recovery. Um, he's he's a young man, he's a fit man, he lives a healthy lifestyle and he'll make the best recovery possible from that and is working very progressively towards uh, a good physical recovery. Obviously there's a huge amount of trauma for anybody who's suffered that sort of an attack uh, but to talk to Kevin, uh, you know, my my admiration for him couldn't be any more because he he speaks about it as if it was just you know something that happened. But we need to move on. We need to work our way forward to make everybody safe. It's never about Kevin when he's when you speak to him. Um, he he's back at his desk. He's back working. Uh, he's getting himself back into his job and he's focused on the future and. Uh, yeah, he's, he. It's it's just remarkable. His resolve to recover from this is is pretty remarkable. <clears throat> In your own point of view, you obviously have been named as a as a potential threat or a target for future attacks. Mm. How much does that worry you uh, or your family, or has that? I presume that has crossed your mind at some stage. Yeah, but. Funny enough, when we spoke about politics and the effect of politics on a family, I remember when I was a kid, uh, if my father lost an election, it went harder on me than it went on him. And I think that this is probably more difficult for my family than it is for me because I'm in the, you know, I'm stuck in the middle of it. I'm in the white heat of all this frenzy. So mm. my energy is always directed and my attention is always directed and is always taken from me. It's, uh, whereas at home, my children have to arrive home from school and wait for me to come home and wonder, you know, will something happen? And I know they worry. And I'm very saddened by the fact that they're exposed to that worry. I also worry for them. I also, you know, you don't... Anybody who can do what they did to Kevin Lunny, uh, the, the barbarity of that attack, uh, the inhumanity of that attack, uh, the, the lack of, of any level of empathy in that attack gives me cause to believe that there's nothing those people wouldn't do so I worry for them and they worry for me and that's a very unpleasant way to live your life but we do have to live our lives they have to go to school every morning I have to go to work every day uh, we have to uh, I have to raise kids and I have to deal with my business and they have to go to their school and Edel has to teach and they have to come home and do their homework and they have to go to their football matches and they have to go to their music and we can't stop doing that we, we have to keep going. I have seen you out and about, obviously, tonight, as we're recording this on Friday night in the dock. It's well publicised where you're going to be. You go to a football match, whether it's Sean O'Heston's or someone locally is playing at it. I've seen you in Park Sean on numerous occasions this summer. Uh, do you worry that something's going to happen? Like, do you live your life with one look over your shoulder? Are you more aware of what's happening around you? Or, or have you increased any personal security or anything like that? Well, you do have to be aware of what's going on around you, and you do have to, uh, I mean, no matter who you are, what happened to Kevin, and the fact that I've been explicitly told that I'm a target of all of that, uh, both by the Gardaí and by the people who did that to Kevin, um, you know, I do have to, when a car pulls in in front of me on the road, if the road is blocked, I immediately check the doors are locked and look all around me to make sure there's nobody coming at me from any particular angle. Uh, I don't like to be surrounded by big people in, in small places. It's just a natural uh, thing to have that level of awareness, that sort of heightened level of awareness. But the Gardaí know what they're at and I have to trust that they know what they're at. And I know that they keep a very close watch and brief on us and they know where we are and they know what our movements are and they know where we're going to be and they have um, they have I think the confidence to know that if anything were to happen to us that they're they're on it so in terms of they know your movement so they know like that you're going to be in the dock tonight and, yeah. and there's an awareness of that I suppose the intelligence that led to the the raids across the country Northern Ireland and in Derbyshire in the UK in the last 10 days uh, would give you some confidence that their intelligence is pretty much honed in on this. Yeah, like those those raids were so coordinated, were so uh, surgical, and seem to have yielded such results that you can only presume that since Kevin's abduction, there has been a massive operation, uh, both north and south of the border, that the intelligence gathering has 
and the technology used for that has been pretty incredible. Um, there's, uh, and I believe that those last that last round of searches has yielded another considerable uh, evidential uh, pile to to aid with uh, the progression of this investigation. And um, you know, I'm I'm uh, I have to take comfort that while right now we do live with a danger. I have to take comfort that there is a future for us that doesn't have this sort of threat in it. Speaking of the future, what is the, the medium to long term future for QIH going forward? And I suppose most importantly, those 800 plus jobs in this region. <clears throat> yeah, well, our objectives haven't changed. Uh, we have taken on this project to preserve the jobs and to grow the businesses and to return them to the trajectory of growth that had been there before. So that plan is unchanged. And uh, while I didn't expect to be involved in it for as long as I'm involved in it now, it, it would appear that this sort of seals me in or locks me in because uh, we have a duty of care to move these uh, businesses out of harm's way and uh, to keep them growing. When we took over, there were only about 600 people in the business units we took over. There's 840 now, so we've added 240 jobs in the four years. And we intend to keep that trajectory of growth. And... We'll put this episode behind us and we'll look for uh, for new ways to grow the businesses and uh, new ways to expand them and to broaden the, the products uh, lines that we, that we offer and to either build new businesses or acquire new businesses. But onwards and upwards is the plan. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming and having a chat with us. I know it can't be easy to relieve these and also just to be so open and honest with us about what you've been going through over the last few weeks and months because it's been very public and it can't have been easy for you and your family. So so thank you very much for taking the time to come in. And you must be kind of getting excited that appointed hour as you're looking at your watch there. Yeah, the I hear the train coming. coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm sure Donald will be delighted to spend a couple of hours in your company tonight yeah. in the dock. Uh, just a reminder, uh, after all that serious chat, you do have an album out that if people yes. want to get a chance to listen, give it one yeah. little plug again there where yeah, people so, can get it. So Dylan Carlos, Keen Sweeney and I um, have a, an album out of just reels and jigs, as I say, music that pleased us but seems to please other people and we have very imaginatively uh, entitled it Carlos Sweeney McCartan. <laughs> Sounds like Carlos Santana McCartan. Yes. <laughs> or somebody said it was a bit, it sounded like um, the solicitors in Father Ted, Carlos, Carlos and Sweeney. <laughs> well, maybe there's a bit of logic to that yeah. as well. John, thank you so much for coming in and uh, the very best of luck to you in all your endeavours over the next few months and years and particularly to your commitment to the people of West Cavan, East Leitrim uh, that work in under that QIH umbrella. Uh, the very best of luck in all of those things going forward. Thank you very much, Bethany. This is, of course, the Current Affairs show, though you wouldn't know it given how much music we've talked over the last half hour or so. Thank you so much to my guest, John McCartan, for coming in and having a chat with us. I will be back tomorrow with an episode of Kiss My Arts when Carrie Gallon man, Seamus O'Rourke, will be in to talk about his new book that's being launched tomorrow afternoon. I'll be back then. Talk to you then. <laughs>